Good morning. I'm Stephen Lee. I'm an elder at First Presbyterian Church of Mesquite, Texas. And I'm also the teacher of the Discipleship Sunday School class. Today we continue with our study of the Gospel of John. And I'd like to remind you that for our curriculum, we're using the Daily Bible Study Series by Professor William Barclay. And for our scripture reading, we're using the new Revised Standard Version of the Bible. Now, last week, we finished the raising of Lazarus, which is in chapter 11. And today we're going to start the aftermath of that. Because remember, in the Gospel of John, John tells us that the reason that Jesus was crucified was because of his raising Lazarus from the dead. Now, the synoptic gospels tell us that Jesus was crucified as a direct result of the cleansing of the temple. So today we're going to study the thinking of the Jews and what led John to this conclusion that led to ultimately to Jesus' crucifixion. So our one scripture reading today is John 11, 45 through 53. Many of the Jews, therefore, who had come with Mary and had seen what Jesus did, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisees and told them what he had done. So the chief priests and the Pharisees called a meeting of the council and said, What are we to do? This man is performing many signs. And if we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and the Romans will come and destroy both our holy place and our nation. But one of them, Caiaphas, who was high priest that year, said to them, You know nothing at all. You do not understand that it is better to have one man die for the people than to have the whole nation destroyed. He did not say this on his own, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus was about to die for the nation. And not for the nation only, but to gather into one the dispersed children of God. So from that day on, they planned to put him to death. The Jewish authorities are vividly sketched here before us. The wonderful happening at Bethany had forced their hand. It was impossible to allow Jesus to continue unchecked. Otherwise, the people would follow him in growing numbers. So the Sanhedrin was called to deal with the situation. And in the Sanhedrin, there were both Pharisees and Sadducees. The Pharisees were not a political party at all. Their sole interest was living according to every detail of the law. And they did not care who governed them as long as they were allowed to continue in meticulous obedience to the law. On the other hand, the Sadducees were intensely political. They were the wealthy aristocratic party. And they were also the collaborationist party. As long as they were allowed to retain their wealth, comfort, and position of authority, they were content to collaborate with Rome. Now, all the priests were Sadducees. And it is clear that it was the priest who dominating, dominated this meeting of the Sanhedrin. That is to say, it's the Sadducees who do all the talking. With a few masterly strokes, John delineates their characteristics. First, they were notoriously discourteous. You know nothing at all, said Caiaphas in 49. Here we see the innate arrogance of the Sadducees. Their contemptuous arrogance is an implicit contrast to the love of Jesus Christ. 
Second, the one thing at which the Sadducees always aimed was the retention of their political and social power and prestige. They feared that Jesus might gain a following and raise a disturbance against the government. Now, Rome was essentially tolerant, but with a, such a vast empire to govern, it would never afford civil disorder and always quelled it with a firm and merciless hand. If Jesus was the cause of civil disorder, Rome would descend in all her power, and the Sadducees would be dismissed from their positions of authority. It never occurred to them to ask whether Jesus was right or wrong. Their only question was, what effect will this have on our ease and comfort and authority? They judged things not in light of principle, but in light of their own careers. And people today still do that. Then comes the first tremendous example of dramatic irony. Sometimes in a play, a character says something whose full significance he does not realize. That is what we call dramatic irony. So the Sadducees insisted that Jesus must be eliminated or the Romans would come and take their authority away. But in AD 70, that's exactly what happened. The Romans, weary of Jewish stubbornness, besieged Jerusalem and left it in a heap of ruins and drew a plow across the temple area. How different things might have been if the Jews had accepted Jesus. The very step they took to save their nation destroyed it. John's gospel was written about AD 100, and all who read it would see the dramatic irony in the words of the Sadducees. Then Caiaphas, the high priest, made his two-edged statement. If you had any sense, he said, you would come to the conclusion that it is far better that one man should perish for the nation than that the whole nation should perish. It was the Jewish belief that when the high priest asked God's counsel for the nation, God spoke through him. Moses chose Joshua to be his successor in the leadership of Israel. But Joshua shared this honor with Eleazar, the high priest. The high priest was the channel of God's word to the leader and to the nation. And that is what Caiaphas was that day. Here's another tremendous example of dramatic irony. Caiaphas meant that it was better that Jesus should die than that there should be trouble with the Romans. It is true that Jesus must die to save the nation, but that is not what Caiaphas meant. It was true in a far greater and more wonderful way. God can speak through the most unlikely people, and sometimes he sends his message through men and women without them even being aware. Jesus was to die for the nation and also for all God's people throughout the world. The early church made a very beautiful use of these words. Its first service order book was called the Didash. It was also called the Teaching of the Twelve Apostles. When the bread was being broken, the Didash was read. Even as this bread was scattered upon the mountains and was brought into one, so let your church be brought together from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. The bread had been put together from the scattered elements of which it was composed. So someday the scattered elements of the church must be united into one. And that is something to think about as we look upon the broken bread of the sacrament. Thank you for joining me today. God bless each and every one of you.